all engine running. <laughs> Absolute genius. Get this. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> this is the show where we bring you science. Back. What that essentially means is discovery is advances, advances, questions, research, technology, unbelievable. Without further ado, this is The Naked Scientist. Hello, welcome to the show where we bring you the latest breakthroughs in science, technology and medicine with Katie Haler and Chris Smith. And this week, as the UK announces the world's most ambitious target for cutting carbon and enshrines it in law, we're looking at how to improve the green credentials of one of the largest carbon contributors, the houses that we live in. Plus, as India sees COVID cases hit more than 300,000 a day, is the emergence of a variant there, and its detection here, cause for concern? And the coffee species, lost for 70 years, are now rediscovered. The Naked Scientist podcast is powered by UKfast.co.uk. India is in the grip of a devastating second wave of COVID-19. The number of documented new cases now exceeds 300,000 per day. And main hospitals, even in Delhi, are running out of oxygen. And that's assuming patients can get a bed in hospital in the first place because there are none left. The tragedy echoes the ongoing situation in Brazil, thought to be fuelled there by the P1 variant and leading some to speculate that the emergence of an Indian variant could be to blame. Murad Banerjee is a Middlesex University mathematician who's been tracking the outbreak from Mumbai. He told Phil Sansom what's happening. Things are very, very bad. Um, It's a devastating situation in many parts of the country. And part of the problem is that because it's all happening so fast, health systems haven't managed to keep up. So many health systems are getting overwhelmed. And even those parts of the country where perhaps the surge hasn't reached in full force yet, the worry is that it's on its way. How has this happened? The speed and the size of this wave has taken people aback, including myself. Places which were previously very badly hit cities like Mumbai and Delhi are being hit again. And the fact that these places are being hit again so badly forces one to wonder whether this is connected perhaps with the spread of new variants. Are people being infected again who have had it before? It's hard not to conclude that people are being infected again. I'm saying this based on seroprevalence surveys, which check for antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. And those surveys have indicated that the great majority of people have been infected, 75%, for example, in some of the slums. And yet you're finding high levels of infection happening again. So in a sense, we are really forced to conclude that at least some of that must be reinfection, but we don't know how much. There is some sequencing going on, and I would really like to be able to say, yes, I understand Mumbai's story or I understand Delhi's story because it coincides with the arrival of the following variant. But Really, we're kind of speculating a lot of the time. I wonder, how would you compare the situation in India to somewhere like Brazil, which seems to be experiencing kind of a similar looking surge? There are many kind of parallels. The most important one being that Brazil appeared to have an improving situation and then everything got very bad again very quickly. There was a story of variants there, obviously. So the lesson should have been, oh, we need to be keeping a very close eye on what variants might be developing. If in India, people making public health policy had been watching what was going on around the world, including, for example, the B117 variant taking over in the UK, then people in India would have said, we we need to be incredibly careful. And one of the things that I think people would have said is that we need to vaccinate as a matter of urgency. Because India actually started vaccinating right at the start of the year, but it proceeded very, very slowly. There was not a sense that this is something we need to do as fast as we can. As far as I'm aware, there have been 130 million vaccine doses. That's roughly one dose so far for every 10 people in the country. For me, that reflected the way that policymakers were not tracking what was happening in other parts of the world. Murad Banerjee on why this is a global problem that needs a global solution. Here in the UK, we are also picking up cases in the community of the COVID variant that is circulating in India and might be behind the surge there. In fact, the Indian variant is now the variant most commonly imported into the country. 
Over 100 cases are being investigated at the moment. So what do we know about it so far? Surprisingly, it's not that new, as Cambridge University microbiologist Sharon Peacock, who leads COG UK, the consortium that's reading the genetic codes of the cases of coronavirus infection that we pick up here, explained to Chris. This particular variant has been around for some time, actually. If you look in the global database, the first genome dates back to around October 2020. There were very small numbers of genomes being deposited into the database then. And by December, that was beginning to pick up. The first case was detected in the UK uh, back in February. And it's been detected now in more than 20 countries. And in terms of when we read the genetic code of this variant, what can that tell us about its likely behaviour or the risk it poses? Well, this particular variant has got 13 different mutations in its genome that result in changes in amino acids. That means it could potentially change the way the virus behaves. It has been called a double mutant in the past, although I think it's important to avoid that because it doesn't have any particular meaning. But what that is referring to is two mutations in the spike protein. That's the protein that interacts with human cells. The numbers given to these mutations is E484Q and L452R. Now, the E484Q is important because changes in that particular position in the genome is associated with immune escape. And the second change, L452R, has also arisen in other variants of interest or under investigation around the world. So that's what people are focused on. Now, we don't really know what those two mutations together actually do in terms of the biology. We're just really speculating across from findings from other variants of interest or concern at the moment. Why do you think it's taking off in India the way that it is? Do you think there's something about this particular variant in the same way that the so-called Kent variant caused a takeoff of the outbreak in the UK last autumn? It's very difficult to know at the moment. The question is whether it's associated with the variant as a direct cause and effect, or whether it's more to do with human behaviour, large gatherings, uh, lack of preventive measures. It could also be down to a change in the virus. We saw a surge with the Kent variant in the UK, and that was down to changes in the virus. It could even be a combination of the two. The change in the genome of the Kent variant that we think has led to the transmissibility is not present in the variant detected in India. So I think really the jury is out. How likely is it to be able to outcompete and and surge ahead as the leading cause of cases here in the UK, like the Kent variant did last autumn? That's a really important question, but quite a difficult one to answer. At the moment, the Kent variant causes 98% of all COVID cases in the UK. And so your question is, uh, could another variant, any any variant actually, uh, the South Africa variant or the India variant, really get a foothold? And people are actually looking at that to see if they can estimate relative fitness of one virus against another. I think it's too early to say the key will be to look at the ability of other variants to transmit between people and spread in the population over time. So what do you think are really the big questions that uh, scientists like yourself need the answers to about this variant now? We need to understand, is the virus innately more transmissible than other viruses or other variants? We need to understand if this variant actually could evade immunity from natural infection or vaccination. The third question would be, does this variant cause a change in disease outcome? Does it cause particularly more severe uh, disease? And what's the best way that we can keep everybody safe, given that we can see these sorts of threats emerging and then spreading in, in other countries around the world at the moment? Vaccination works. And the way to keep people safe, both in, in the UK and elsewhere, is, is to vaccinate people. Vaccines are highly effective against the Kent variant, and they're likely to provide protection against other variants too. So the key for me is vaccination. The next thing we need to do is really to stress the continued importance of our own behaviour, washing our hands, wearing a face mask, ensuring that we are distanced from each other and undertaking activities outdoors. So the two together are are really key in, in controlling 
both the variants that we understand, but the variants that are yet to come. Variants don't emerge unless disease is occurring. And so our best hope of controlling variants is to actually control disease as a whole. You know, the Kent variant is changing over time. And so we shouldn't only be focused on the issue of border control and importation and ignore the possibility that the Kent variant actually may develop other mutations that are actually important biologically, including vaccine escape. So we have to have a kind of a dual focus on on what is happening. Sharon Peacock there. Since the pandemic began, we've wondered, do our genes make a difference to who gets COVID? Nathan Pearson is part of the enormous team that have just found out. So when we scan across, we see this really tremendous spike in kind of a very intriguing but also mysterious spot. That's in the long interview on this month's Naked Genetics. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Still to come on the programme this week, stick around to discover how you can green up your home's carbon credentials. 65 years. That is how long we've got before one of our most valuable metals in the electrical, electronics and plumbing industries runs out. I'm talking, of course, about copper. But in the course of extracting this precious commodity, which is mined chiefly in the Americas, Africa and China, the environment often pays a really high price. Copper-rich acidic mine waste in the form of dissolved copper compounds like copper sulphate flows into local rivers, lakes and the soil, where it's a potent poison that destroys the local ecology. But Deborah Rodriguez at the University of Houston, Texas, thinks she might have a solution. She went to look at what did live in areas hit by this pollution and was surprised to find flourishing communities of microorganisms that have evolved to pick up these copper contaminants and turn them back into tiny fragments of harmless copper metal. It's early days, but this might be one way to clean up mine sites and help us to solve our looming copper crisis. A lot of the copper mines that we have right now, they have a lot of leaching that comes out of it and they don't use. So we waste a lot of copper and then you generate a lot of contamination and pollution in the area as well. So here actually in my back, I don't know if you can see, I have actually a a lake that is contaminated with copper and you see how blue it is <laughs> yes you, i see you've got your video up there and uh, and your backdrop is a it's, it's a very pretty color but not terribly pretty for things to live in i gather no and that kills a lot of life fish animals and all so it actually creates a huge impact in the environment so what we we are trying to do is actually obtaining microorganisms from the environment They can harvest this copper from the water, from soil, from different environments. And they actually, they accumulate inside their cells. And we can actually collect those microbes and take from them. When you say they collect the copper, do they collect the the dissolved form of copper and turn it back into metal then? Is that what you're saying? That's right. That's exactly what I'm saying. They actually, they get the liquid uh, part, the dissolved one, and they they transform in a solid uh, material. Before you tell us how you discovered that they exist, why do the microbes want to do that? Well, like uh, all living beings, we always try to make our environment better for survival. They are not different from us. They actually, they try to harvest the copper and make it in an insoluble material so it make it less toxic to them so they can survive in that environment. So by being forced to live in a copper-rich, copper-contaminated area, the microbes solve the problem by basically turning the copper into something which is less toxic, which is back into the metal form. That's right. Which, you know, funnily enough, we want. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> we want that, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> How did these microbes come to your attention? To be honest, we were not actually looking specific for them. We were actually trying to understand the diversity of microbes in this environment. But I think that's the fun part of research, is that uh, sometimes we're looking for something and we find something completely different. That can be even better. <laughs> Do you know chemically how the microbes are recapturing this dissolved copper and turning it back into the metal in this way? They are actually uh, reducing copper sulfate in the water to produce copper. And they are using proteins, like we all use proteins for 
digesting food, they use the proteins to digest the metal and transform in something else. I suppose then there, there are two options here, aren't there? Either you could use the microbes as is to clean up wastewater or you go and steal what it is that they have evolved to have, these proteins that can do this, and you just basically mass produce those and use the proteins, not the bugs. Yes, you can certainly do that. You can certainly do that. You can use either the bugs and extract from the bugs or use their proteins, extract their proteins and mass produce it. So there are two ways that you can do it. This is then a first step. The microbes are showing you that it's possible. Now it's a question of in some way optimising this, either directly by fiddling with the microbes or fiddling with the proteins that that they make to produce a, a more optimal, more efficient system. That's correct. Do you think that's going to be feasible? I think it will. I think it's feasible. Considering how our technology is evolving, I think it's going to be totally feasible. Yes. Deborah Rodriguez. The market for coffee is massive. And despite the fact that there are over 100 species of coffee plants that we know of, only two, that's Arabica and Robusta, make up the majority of what gets drunk, due to the fact that for most consumers... The rest just tastes awful. But Arabica and Robusta are both very sensitive to temperature and rainfall, and changing climate means growing them is likely to become much harder in the future as suitable terrain dwindles. One potential strategy is to find another coffee plant that is more hardy to warmer climates but still delicious. And this week, Eva Higginbotham heard from Aaron Davis at the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew, who's rediscovered a coffee species called Stenophylla that so far ticks all the boxes. We found a coffee that will take much higher temperatures than Arabica coffee and yet tastes very much like it. Coffea stenophylla, that's the Latin name, or just stenophylla coffee, or sometimes Sierra Leone coffee. It comes from Upper West Africa, in Guinea, in Ivory Coast, and Sierra Leone. And it was cultivated in those countries up until the 1920s, and then pretty much disappeared. All the early historic reports tell us that it has an amazing flavour. And one report in particular tells us that it has a better flavour than Arabica. So there's a lot of interest in this plant. The trouble is we just didn't have a sample to taste. What we really wanted to do was find it in the wild, which we did in December 2018. It was sort of rediscovered, as it were, in Sierra Leone. It hadn't been seen there since 1954. Last year, we were able to taste that and were greatly surprised and relieved to find that it did taste excellent. How did you go about finding it if it had been lost for like 70 years? We're working in collaboration with partners in Sierra Leone. So we discussed this with Daniel, our Sierra Leonean partner, and he said, look, let's make some posters and distribute them to farmers around Sierra Leone to see if anybody's growing it still. So what Daniel did was to travel around the country on a motorbike, giving these sort of wanted posters out to farmers. And that generated not a great response. We had two or three responses from that. And we went out to those farms and it wasn't there. It was was Robusta coffee. Plan B was to try and find it where it was last seen in the wild. When you found it, how did you know that it was the same plant as had been written about in the books from before? My speciality is wild coffee species. My job was to actually, once we're in the forest, to identify it amongst all the other plants in the forest. And we're talking about a very dense forest. Thousands of plants in front of you, they're all green. Typically nothing's in flower or fruit, so we've got nothing to go on apart from the leaves. And it was a matter of just looking each leaf to see whether this was the plant we were looking for. And I can't remember whether it was Daniel or Jeremy who said to me, it, you know, is this it? And I said, no, is this it? No. And then A little bit later, is this it? I said, yeah, that's it. I was quite confident, but nobody else was. So what we did was to take a DNA sample from a collection of stenophylla that was sent to Kew in 1873, extract the DNA from that old coffee bean, extract the DNA from the leaf in the forest to be absolutely sure that this was stenophylla. So we knew we had the right thing, but we had to wait until May 2020 to actually get a small sample for the initial tasting. And what does it taste like? Arabica coffee. And, you know, the first tasting, the panel leader, who's a very experienced coffee taster, said it actually tasted like a Rwandan Arabica, which is a very specific flavour profile. And what we're hoping is that it 
actually has some different qualities to it that will make it desirable for those coffee connoisseurs who are willing to pay high prices for coffee. Do you get tasting notes from it, like this is a vanilla-y flavoured or tastes a bit like wood or anything? Absolutely. Fruitiness, like elderflower syrup, English candy, all those that sort of excite your palate and, and you know make the coffee something special. What about the coffee bean itself makes it taste different from another species of coffee bean in terms of the molecular chemistry? That's the key question. We're really still trying to understand the chemical basis of a good cup of coffee. Many others have done a lot of research on the taste of coffee and it's still elusive. You know, there are over a thousand different chemicals involved in coffee flavour. It's not straightforward. So what's your hope for this plant going forward? Our hope initially is really for countries like Sierra Leone who own the biological heritage of this plant. And for Sierra Leone, it's really part of their cultural heritage as well. So, you know, the hope it's something that can be used to reinvigorate coffee farming in Sierra Leone. I think that's our first aim. And in the long term, because Stenophila has these features, this great taste, ability to withstand hot temperatures, and also the ability to uh, resist some of the most severe diseases for coffee and we think that it might have some drought tolerance. As a breeding resource, it ticks lots of boxes and, and for the long term the hope is that it will be used in a breeding work to generate uh, the world's next generation of coffees. Aaron Davis answering our coffee prayers. His paper has just been published in the journal Nature Plants and if you'd like to find out more about the news stories we've discussed... The links to each of the reference papers are on our website, nakedscientist.com, along with transcripts of each interview for every Naked Scientist show. And if you'd like more neuroscience in your life, check out our Naked Neuroscience podcast. Recent episodes include why boredom is anything but boring, why us dog lovers are such suckers for puppy dog eyes, and the brain benefits of a walk in the park. And this month's episode ponders the mysterious human mind. You can find all the episodes and more at nakedscientist.com slash neuroscience or search Naked Neuroscience wherever you get your podcasts. The Naked Scientist podcast is produced in association with Spitfire, cost-effective voice, internet and IP engineering services for UK businesses. Find out how Spitfire can empower your company at spitfire.co.uk. Music in the program is sponsored by Epidemic Sound. Perfect music for audio and video productions. And for the rest of the program this week, we're going to embark on a green spring clean because we're going to explore some of the science around making our homes cleaner and greener. And we don't just mean in terms of colour, we're talking about their carbon credentials and leaner in terms of the resources we use. We'll be tackling textiles, investigating insulation and weighing up the carbon cost of waste water from the tangible changes we can implement now to how housing stock and policies could change in the future. But first, let's fill up our metaphorical bucket, dip in our mop and wring out a few home truths about water. We drink it, cook with it and wash with it. But are we taking enough care of our water, particularly since some parts of the world are predicted to become drier through climate change? A recent paper in the journal Science estimates that up to a fifth of groundwater wells are at risk of running dry. So how can we tread a bit more lightly in the way we use water in our homes in the future? Well, with us now is Sarah Ward. She's from the West Country Rivers Trust. They're a charity with the mission to preserve, protect, develop and improve local water courses. I suppose a good way to embark on this journey, Sarah, is to find out how the water gets into our homes in the first place. So can you just sort of take us on that water distribution journey? We call that the urban water cycle and it very much starts with taking water from the environment. So um, as you mentioned, that might be groundwater or that might be surface water. So from watercourses like rivers and then that's treated at a water treatment plant using chemicals and physical processes, which obviously takes energy. And then it's pumped into our houses using more energy and through a vast network of pipes and valves and other infrastructure. And, And that's the part that gets kind of expensive both in terms of money energy and of course carbon emissions and then it comes out of our taps when we turn them on. I suppose it's not automatically intuitive that water would have a carbon footprint but for the reasons you've outlined it clearly does. 
That's right. Yeah. So about 11% of the carbon emissions that are sort of generated um, in the water uh, production process goes into the treatment and the transport. And then, of course, we've got heating of water in homes as well. And that can account for about 89% of the water that we use in terms of, or sorry, the carbon that we use when we're thinking about water. So obviously, anything that translates into a more efficient use of water and and a more efficient use of hot water, that's going to translate into a carbon saving, isn't it? So that's got to be good news. Um, In terms of, of what sort of share of the water that the UK uses, how big is the domestic market as a proportion? approximately 49% of the public water supply goes to what we would call um, domestic use um, and commercial uses, and that's household and non-household. And then about 51% goes to agriculture, industry and energy production. So you can see that that 49% is quite a big amount. Yes, indeed. And how, how efficient are we at using it? In other words, when it all ends up going down the drain, ultimately, admittedly, but when it comes into our home, how much ends up going to the intended source and how much is wasted? That's a good point. So in the UK, we have about 20% leakage from that big um, infrastructure system of pipes and valves and things that I mentioned. That's actually not too bad. Out of every five glasses of water, one has gone down the drain rather than down a person's throat. That's it. Yeah. So that's lost in that distribution from the treatment plant to the home. So, yeah, you know, if it depends on area, but if that water travels over um, a large area between where it's taken out of the river or the groundwater to where it's then turned on and comes out of your tap. Yeah, that that can be quite a big loss. But in terms of the overall efficiency, then, so 20 percent gets wasted. But other things like the the thermal uses, the carbon footprint and so on, are there savings to be made in terms of how we, we use our water? There are definitely. So, yeah, within our home, we use about 25 percent in the shower, for example, 20 to 25 percent in the kitchen. But what we actually flush down the toilet is is one that makes the least sense, perhaps, because we flush anywhere between 20 and 30 percent of bear in mind, this is drinking quality water down the toilet you know it depends on the type of toilet you've got and how old it is and those kind of things it's one of those questions that we have to ask ourselves of you know is is it right that we flush drinking quality water down the loo sad isn't it that in some parts of the world people are dying because they can't get anything to drink and we're chucking the stuff down the toilet quite literally is there no better way to do this because i often watch the water swirl down the plug hole in the bath or in the shower and i'm thinking that actually i could still drink that it might have a bit of shampoo in it but it's a hell of a lot better than what some people are drinking for their daily water can't we use that better to say water the garden or 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 chuck that down the toilet for example why do we throw it away Indeed. Um, yeah, it just takes a shift in, in sort of thinking and behaviour, really. And what you refer to there, you know, the, the water from your bath or hand basin, that's what we call grey water. And very much so you can reuse that, um, you know, in the garden or, you know, washing your car if you store it in a, a water butt, um, those kind of things. Also rainwater harvesting. So that's water that falls on your roof and then goes down your downpipe. It might go into a water butt or it might go into, you know, a larger rainwater harvesting system. And that can be really good because what that's doing is that's capturing water where it falls and then you're using it where it's fallen. So it doesn't have to be transported and pumped using energy and producing carbon emissions um, to your home. And that's a really good way to bring down um, water use. Thing is, Sarah, that when you look at new build houses, they still chuck the shower and the bath water down the drain. There's no kind of policy that says, and there has to be a water scavenging system in this design that will route that water to somewhere else useful. It's not sort of a building regulation yet, is it? And similarly, we haven't got a system that's easy to implement in your average existing home so a person who's minded to want to do their bid can easily do it they've got to put a bucket in the toilet with them you know in the shower with them haven't they to flush the toilet with if they in want the to shower. do that. yeah that's right yeah so um water reuse is sort of recommended in lots of different building um, standards and different guidance and there are some provisions in the building regulations but they're not as sort of strict or as tied down as they could be um I guess something to bear in mind is that uh, the average amount of water a person uses in a day, so what we call per capita consumption, has dropped from um, about 148 
146, 148 litres um, in 2011, 2012 to around 141 litres um, in 2016, 2017. That varies a bit if you've got a metre or if you haven't got a metre. But what the real aim could be, and this was under some previous green building guidance, was getting it down to around 100 or 80 litres. Um, and that can be achieved by the things that we've been talking about. So grey water or rainwater, but also things that you can do, you know, simple as turning off the tap when brushing your teeth and also putting what we call cistern displacement devices in your cistern. So that might be a, a thing called a hippo, which people can get from their water company or a brick, which displaces about, about a kilogram of water. So there are things people can do, but also the kitchen sink tends to be the most energy and carbon consumptive because because that uses generally a lot of hot water. So there's a lot mm. of carbon to be saved by saving water from your kitchen sink and reusing it. And don't leave the hot tap turned on all the time. Sarah, thank you so much. That's Sarah Ward with some good tips for us on how we can improve our green credentials when it comes to the kitchen sink. Now, let's turn to textiles, the curtains, carpets and other soft furnishings, as well as the contents of your wardrobe. This is a very thirsty industry too. Every kilo of cotton that we make requires potentially tens of thousands of litres of water. That is a lot, isn't it? And there's also a hefty carbon footprint that comes along for free as well. Textiles make more emissions, would you believe it, than international flights and the entire maritime shipping industry. So what can we do to lighten the load? Well, to get started, Katie has been having a clear out. I have just pulled most of this old carpet off my stairs and some rather old lino off the floor in the kitchen. I've shampooed them, scrubbed them, but they are not fit for purpose anymore. And I don't really know what to do with them next. Can they be recycled? Are they destined for landfill? What do I do? Luckily, I know an expert, Sarah Gray from the UK-based NGO RAP, the Waste and Resources Action Programme best thing I think is probably to try to find somebody else who would be grateful to use it. If it's not usable again, some local councils do provide a collection service, but there are other things you could do like chopping up the old carpet for example and using it perhaps as bedding for animals, maybe at the local animal rescue centre. Something I enjoy doing is gardening and I use old carpet as a barrier for the weeds. It doesn't matter if it's synthetic. You can cut holes in it to plant for it. You can move it around when you want to clear another patch of weeds. Great idea. I've been meaning to get my veggie bed ready for ages. And it sounds like more than enough textiles are already going to landfill. Households were throwing away perhaps about 300,000 tonnes of clothes every year. And about the same again, a bit more of household textiles. So things like curtains, bed linen, towels, things like that. As much as, as 500,000 tonnes of those uh, were thrown away the last time we counted in one year. Think about it like one tonne of those textiles. You'd probably be able to fill uh, a large, maybe a long wheelbase van. So 500,000 of those vans, and that's what we've thrown away in one year. It's a huge amount. So what is the carbon footprint impact of diverting would-be landfill items and giving things another lease of life? So the effect of throwing things out, there is an impact associated with landfilling them. That's a small amount of, of the carbon footprint is to do with greenhouse gas emissions, especially methane coming from, from landfills. By reusing textiles, of course, we avoid that. But the other thing is that we're avoiding having to produce as much in the first place. That's what to do with the old stuff. But when it comes to buying new home furnishings, how do you separate the green products from the greenwash? That is a really good question. And greenwash has been around for a long time, but I think it's a, a real concern at the moment. What we really need to be able to do is to get good information on the products we're buying and be able to check that information to see whether it's true. And that isn't that easy at the moment. One way that you can check is perhaps finding out a bit about the labels that appear on things by doing your own research, perhaps on the internet, um, to see what those labels mean. What are they actually offering to do by saying 
that something is eco in one way or another. And another is just looking on the company's website that are selling the items and seeing what their sustainability policies are. But at the moment, we're having to do quite a lot of work ourselves to get that kind of information. There's definitely room, I think, for clearer labelling and more information just being available with the product itself. One option is to move away from using raw materials in the first place. The more that we can use old textiles and turn them back into textiles again when they're not usable anymore is kind of the optimum way to recycle because you create a a circle that can continue, it can go on and on. Um, So potentially there is a really great way available to us there to avoid having to extract more raw materials, which is where we think the highest environmental impact comes from. If we can just keep things going in that continuous circle, then that really is is where we think there's the greatest potential to to make a difference in, in the long term. It's a real challenge right now, and we need to invest a bit in new technology, sorting the stuff that's put out for collection to be able to separate the different fibre types And then we need the recycling technology to grow. So the amount of textile recycling going on at the moment, especially where that value is maintained in the product, there's hardly any of it. It's really in its infancy. And this is where we're looking to see more innovation. And potentially it could get quite exciting over the next few years as we see industry looking to respond to that challenge. So I asked Sarah for her top green tips if you are going to choose a new item. Do look at the label and look to see what information there is with that product and and be prepared to check it if you don't mind. Look to see what you can find out about the information provided with it. But also the main thing I would really say is choose something that you love, that you'll want to keep. By keeping things in use for longer, by not replacing too frequently, but choosing things that, that don't wear out and and that you carry on loving as well. That's a really good way to to have something more sustainable in your home. There is plenty of secondhand stuff available, and there are more ways that we can buy it than there used to be. So you can buy great things at your local charity shop, but you can also find lots of places online that you can buy as well now. I love that sentiment, and one of the most important profound points I've actually never heard someone make. Buy something you love and hang on to it. Look after it keep it for a long time. That's one of the best things that we can do for the environment. That was Sarah Gray from RAP and they're just about to launch actually a voluntary agreement which is called Textiles 2030 and its aim will be to help retailers as well as the rest of us to put some of what she was saying there into practice. Well let's move on next to buildings themselves and how this impacts home energy usage. Cambridge University's Tim Foreman is an expert on how we retrofit buildings to make them a bit more energy efficient. He's with us now. Tim I understand that you're just moving house so how does the old compare with the new? Did you do an energy assessment? I'm now on a flat, well insulated, it's airtight, draft free. The neighbourhood's nice but to me energy efficiency is most important so, so the move has gone well thanks. Have you got uh, neighbours above and below and to either side? Because, of course, that's the best way to be energy efficient. I know some students that used to purposefully choose flats in that sort of position in houses or in streets so that they couldn't have the heating on all the time. They just relied on their neighbours to do this do it instead. Absolutely. That is a that is absolutely a, a key benefit to a flat. Far more efficient having fewer external walls and, of course, also shared facilities and reasonable amount of space rather than a far too large amount of space. Well, we're on the subject of housing, and this week the UK government announced a legally binding target to reduce the CO2 emissions of the UK by an ambitious 78% compared with the levels as they were in 1990, and to do all of that by as soon as 2035. Now, that is one of the world's most ambitious global targets for this. But the lion's share of our current household carbon budget is actually eaten up by what we've just been talking about, and that's heating. And that potentially means a mass retrofit for the buildings we all live in, which are currently far from efficient in many cases. And this is something the government are very acutely aware of. They have a plan in place for, they tell us. And that's what Business Secretary Kwasi Kwarteng told BBC Radio for us today programme this week. Let's have a listen to what he said. Heat in buildings is a big challenge. I mean, decarbonising heat sources uh, and also uh, improving energy efficiency of homes is, is a big challenge. We've got a heat and building strategy, which will be very clear, will be very full of policies, will be very full 
of directions, and that's going to be coming out uh, only in the next uh, couple of months. So, Tim Foreman, how big is the problem facing the UK government? What have they got to sort of drag uphill in terms of what sort of boulder have they got to get to the top of Everest to solve this problem? How bad are our homes? I think Everest is a fair metaphor. It's, frankly, it's, it's difficult to overstate. It's a huge challenge. We've got in the UK, perhaps Europe's least energy efficient housing, the complexity of the challenge. Um, it's probably not an overstatement to say it's roughly equivalent to space race in terms of the level of innovation and mobilizing across society that's required. Indeed, there's a report in, in one of the, the newspapers this weekend saying that uh, some of the technologies that are going to be needed to solve this problem don't even exist yet. Um, when we say retrofitting, though, Tim, what is going to happen to the average home in order to, to get it up to the standards that we're going to need everyone's home to be at to meet this very ambitious goal? We can think about it if we consider the energy that goes in and the energy that goes out, if you will. But by the energy that goes in, I mean the energy supply. And we're all probably by now familiar with things like solar panels, which are decarbonizing our energy supply. The other side of the issue, and perhaps the more important side of the issue, is the actual energy efficiency. So if we think of the home as a sort of an equation, we have a certain amount of energy that needs to go in to keep it at a comfortable temperature, and a certain amount of that energy is going to be leaking out as waste. What we really need to do is test the waste first, that we're not attempting to use greener supplies of electricity for, for buildings which are inherently very inefficient. We think that about 80 to 90 percent of homes are currently plumbed into our UK gas distribution network. The building regulations say that close to 2030, we we won't be allowing any new houses to be connected to that network. We'll have to have other sources of of heat and an energy provision going into those homes. So what does that mean in practice then? What will what will be heating our homes and heating our water in the future? There's a lot of excitement at the moment around hydrogen as a direct replacement for natural gas heating. Um, I think that certainly has a great deal of potential. Fundamentally, I think the most important thing is that the energy that is being supplied to a home needs to be green. We know that. But we need to dramatically reduce the amount of that energy that's required to keep a home comfortable. So we know we can do that. We just don't know exactly how we can mobilize uh, the financing and the innovation, the technology, and the labour supply and the skilled workforce to do that. Those are the real challenges. Well, we do, do, do we know how big the price tag is, Tim, and who's going to pay for it? Frankly, I don't think we do. We can make lots of estimates, and I think we can make very educated estimates. Until I think we are some way into this, I'm not sure that we can say with real confidence what this will cost. It's safe to say that it's a national-scale investment. The other side of that, though, it's a, it's a once-in-a-generation opportunity. This is a, a huge opportunity to make gains through efficiency. So in many ways, this is very smart investment to make. But will it be something we're comfortable living with? As one person pointed out in a letter to the Daily Telegraph this week, they live in a house with a balcony and there's an air source heat pump under that balcony. And when it's running, you can't go on the balcony. You'd be deaf. And if a whole street ran heat pumps like that, then everyone would be deaf and the neighbourhood would be one noisy neighbourhood. So what sort of looks nice from far is sometimes far from nice. That's a fair statement. I would say, though, that an energy efficient home is typically a more comfortable home, certainly, and it's typically a more healthy home. Perhaps uh, noisy heat condensers aside, uh, I think, generally speaking, energy efficiency improvements are all around improvements in homes. Do you think we're going to make it, Tim? Do you think that the government is going to be so wide of this target that they're going to make us a laughing stock, or do you think we're honestly going to get there? You've really put me on the spot with that question. I'm an optimist by nature. I have to believe that we can do this. Um, I think we have the technology, roughly speaking, that we need uh, for the moment. I think it's primarily a social problem, a human problem. But we've seen, you know, maybe if you'd asked me a year ago, my answer might have been different. But in the last 12 months, we've seen an incredible amount of mobilizing across the scientific community, across society. And that's exactly what we need in housing. And uh, perhaps if we've learned one thing in the last year, we know that you know, real radical change is possible, and that's what we need. Let's hope we can get it done. Tim, thanks very much. This is Tim Foreman from the University of Cambridge. So far, we've discussed greener alternatives to the ways we use water, textiles and energy in the home. And to reflect on these aspects is behaviour change psychologist Joe Hale from UCL. Joe, what factors actually feed into making greener choices in the first place? I think it can be helpful to think about capability, opportunity and motivation factors. So these are the three conditions needed for any kind of behaviour change, including making greener actions. So capability refers to our knowledge and skills and physical abilities. Opportunity is more about 
our resources, so the time and money at our disposal, um, and our physical surroundings and our social environment as well. And then motivation involves, on the one hand, our attitudes, beliefs and values, so quite reflective aspects, and also our emotions and routines and habits, which are more automatic drivers of behaviour. And these three factors aren't completely separate, they interact. So, for example, having greater capability and more opportunity could lead to more motivation to make a change. So could you apply this modelling to maybe a few of the things that we've been talking about, like water or avoiding textiles ending up in landfill or, or energy use? Yeah, sure. So for each of those three areas, we can think about what barriers might there be in terms of people's capability, opportunity or motivation, and then how to remove those barriers. So just to take some examples, for using water more wisely, we might find that actually our old habits and routines around using the shower and the sink and the washing machine tend to override things. And that's a motivation factor. Uh, and to maybe overcome that, you could do something like putting a prompt in your environment. So maybe use a timer in the shower. I have a little sand timer provided by Thames Water. Or you could do something like put a sticker on the washing machine uh, to remind you not to use some of the settings. For things to do with textiles, we know that an opportunity barrier is that people feel they don't really have the time to make repairs and alterations, even if they have the skills to do so. So maybe to um, overcome that, um, providing a service that uh, could do the repairs and alterations for you would help. And around energy efficiency, we know that people um, have a capability barrier and that they find the options really confusing. It's hard to just know what to do and what your home needs. So in those cases, something like an advice portal could be really helpful or even having a new role um, for someone like a retrofit designer who could be a person that would provide tailored advice to you and your household. It is interesting and relevant, I think, that you mentioned cost because some, you know, some of these changes don't cost any money and some of them can be very expensive. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's really important that we recognise that different people face different barriers to making green choices. And cost is a really major factor, particularly in some of the bigger carbon emission saving uh, things that we want people to do, like making uh, major alterations to their homes. So it's really important that that's taken into account so that all changes are affordable and accessible to everyone. In terms of policy, do we know what works in terms of encouraging people to make greener choices where that is possible? Well, we know what doesn't work, which is just telling people what to do and why it's important. That's usually not enough because it addresses people's knowledge, that sort of capability, but maybe not so much opportunity or motivation. So policies are most likely to work when they first look at what's preventing people making greener choices and then match up a suitable intervention. So, for example, the carrier bag charge was really effective because it's removed the things that were probably prompting people to use plastic bags in supermarkets, which was just being offered it as a default option and it being free, so really convenient. Um, but there won't really be a one size fits all to policies uh, for achieving big targets like net zero, because like I said, people face different barriers to making green choices. And so different types of solutions are needed. And it's really important that policies don't exacerbate the existing inequalities that already exist to disadvantage some people in the UK. As you say, you know, we are all individuals and our living situations are unique. So how can we figure out what changes are most likely to make a difference in our own situation? Yeah, so it can be really confusing, but luckily there are loads of tools and apps and websites now which can help to understand where the biggest carbon savings can be made and what you personally can do. So one good one that I like is the Grantham Institute's list of nine things you can do about climate change. Um, and some of the biggest impact actions are things like eating less meat and dairy, flying and using the car less, and of course, saving energy and water at home. Um, but I would say as well, once you've had a look at what to do, make an intention to do something about it. So put it in your diary or uh, on your to-do list, because forming a clear intention will help you to carry through on that action. And just as importantly as these individual actions, talk about what you're doing and don't be afraid to ask for help um, because all of that helps to push this higher up on the agenda. Joe Hale, thank you ever so much. And thank you to our other guests this week, Sarah Ward, Sarah Gray and Tim Foreman. And finally, to question of the week, Phil has been unzipping this question from listener Ellie. How do zip files work on my computer? 
Those are files that end in the letters .zip, and to do anything with them, you have to first click a button that says Extract, and somehow out come a new set of files. What on earth is going on? Well, here's how research data scientist Peter Foster sees it. A zip file is a convenient way to bundle up one or more files with the seemingly magical property that its contents are shrunk in size, but no information is lost. In this sense, zip files are all about data compression. Without lovely compression, we could be drowning in data. Watching an uncompressed, high-definition video could easily burn through your whole monthly mobile data plan in a single second. But thanks to compression, watching YouTube on your phone could still leave gigabytes to spare. And this isn't just for computers. We all use our own kind of data compression when we use text speak, for example, acronyms and abbreviations to shorten our messages. This works if the recipient knows the meaning behind the text speak. If you wanted to be 100% certain that the person you're texting can decode your texts, you'd send them all the text speak definitions you're using in advance through a carefully chosen dictionary. This kind of dictionary would tell you that LOL is code for laughing out loud, for example, but it could also use custom abbreviations for phrases that appear a lot in your specific message. And with the right abbreviations, the overall coded message, plus dictionary, could be much, much shorter. In a similar way, zip files are encoded versions of the files that they contain, interspersed with dictionary entries which together allow us to decode the files. The abbreviations can represent sequences of data of any length, for example, strings of characters. In other words, compression is all about finding and exploiting patterns in data. No patterns, no compression. If you tried to zip up a file which contained only randomly generated data, you'd need to be extremely lucky to see any shrinkage in the zipped version. And so we have today's zip files. By the way, the zip file is an example of lossless data compression, which simply means without loss of information. But it's also worth mentioning that there are other types of compression which are lossy, like JPEG for images or MP3 for audio. And that last one is probably how you're hearing me now. Thanks very much to Peter Foster from the Alan Turing Institute. Next time, we're answering this question, and don't let it bug you, from listener Jeffrey. We've had a cold and snowy winter, and I've had to shovel my driveway every few days. We had a fly in our house, and I was curious if it survived the cold somehow or recently hatched. So do you think you know what happens to flies when it gets a bit chilly? If so, come and join the debate on our forum, that's nakedscientist.com forward slash forum, or you can email it together with any new questions you might have to me, chris at thenakedscientist.com. There's also an online question form that makes things easy, nakedscientist.com slash question. Before we go, we have a rather exciting opportunity or two to tell you about here at The Naked Scientists. We are hiring, and we're looking for producers and presenters to join the team. Find out the details, including how you can apply, at nakedscientist.com slash job. That's it for this week, but Katie, thank you very much for putting the programme together, and thanks also for all your contributions over the last four years. You are leaving us, and we're very sorry to see you go. It's been great having you with us. Thanks, Chris. It's been a real pleasure. Next time, we're poking and prodding at the science behind the latest headlines alongside a range of star guests. Global COVID, carbon budgets and more, all to make sure you stay informed on science. The Naked Scientist comes to you from Cambridge University's Institute of Continuing Education and is sponsored by Rolls-Royce. I'm Katie Haler. Thanks very much for listening and goodbye. Goodbye.